minutes the first time you did them. And so now you're trying to go for all of them again in six minutes. But when then do you plan on weighing the round? When do you plan on having overviews and underviews? When do you plan on like winning the debate? Right? Then you're just like extending the whole debate from before. But you're never sitting there, this is the last chance you have to talk with this judge. And you're blowing it by going for everything, just rather than winning the debate. Like don't be afraid, don't be afraid to lose an argument. Like that's the worst thing you can do is like have an ego that prevents you from losing arguments. You're always going to lose arguments. And you should. You want to lose them. Um, because you want them to make mistakes by killing you on argument they don't need to kill you on. Sometimes you can bait. There are always, there's a guy, you, some of you probably had him as a judge. Some of you may know him personally. I always thought that Chris Shaw was an easy debater to just trap because you could piss him off in a debate round so easily. You could like spend the first two minutes of your speech making dumb, dumb arguments, and he would always overcover them. Always. It's just like without fail. Um, there are other people out there that John Colsheen always overcovers T. Every damn time. I don't know why more people didn't realize that every time John Colsheen debated on the affirmative, he would overcover topicality. Right? Like, you can just trap people that way. And so <clears throat> sometimes. You want to lose arguments. You are making arguments in order to lose them sometimes because you know that's where you're going to get your time trick off and really be able to punish them on the natural time skew of NFL in debate. Um, so change the order in your 1 and R to point out where those mistakes happened. Um, we talked about before on the 1 AR that theory offense makes it harder for them to do that. Right? If you, want to, if you ran three procedurals and want to kick them all, it's much harder to kick all three procedurals that you ran if the affirmative ran offense against them in terms of theory offense. So make sure you pay attention to and have a, comp don't check out, don't be like, okay, they've already spent two and a half minutes on effects T, not going here. Don't put your flow away until they're done. Like, I've also seen too many debates lost because someone did that and then the last argument out of their mouth was an RBI and they kicked the topicality and forgot there was an RBI in the bottom. Like I've seen that happen too. So even after you've decided you're not gonna go for something, make sure you pay attention to theory offense. And if they do have theory offense, you can still kick the topicality. It just might mean you have to make three or four arguments first about why RBIs are dumb. And then you kick the topicality, right? And the, the negative got, I mean the affirmative got what they wanted out of it. They took 15 to 20 seconds away from you that you should have otherwise had. But I mean, sometimes you just have to call a truce on those things and just still kick it. because you. You're, the affirmative's really getting what they wanted if you go for that topicality, right? Then they're, it's even better for the affirmative. Because not only do you still have to answer the RBI problem, if, there's, if there were good RBIs, you also have to answer their responses to T to try to win the T debate. Because T debates so many times are just won because the negative makes like one concession, concedes like one argument on the standards, or like concedes <coughs> one component of the counter interpretation, or concedes a voter. Or like it comes down to really small things sometimes. So to win T when you're the negative, you have to win almost every argument on the T flow to win T. Almost every one. Especially because T's usually enough. People don't want to go for topicality unless like unless like it was a Puerto Rico app or something instead of a Cuba app. Like then people want to go now. But assuming that that's not what's happening in the debate, people, for instance, like there's been some muttering that lifting sanctions might not be topical. But most critics are not going to want to vote on that topicality. If you do the right work as the affirmative, I think most people are going to be like, come on, we're talking about Cuba. Lifting the embargo is probably the most relevant and germane thing we could do in this debate round. Like, you should be uh, perceptually ahead on that T already. And so <clears throat> you really would, if you were the negative, have to win every argument on that T flow to win that topicality probably. Um, and so you need to make sure you answer the theory offense. And so changing the order means that if you waited to the end of your speech to kick things, but there was theory offense you had to answer, now you might be dropping RBIs at the bottom of your speech. You always go to what you want to kick first, give your overview, kick your arguments, answer their theory offense, and then spend the whole rest of your speech winning the arguments you want to go for. So collapsing the debate lets you do a couple things. First off, it gets the most advantage out of that 6-3 time skew as you can. Um, because not only are you might only be going for two arguments, and it might feel like if they only have three minutes to answer two arguments, that the affirmative's in good shape. But that's not really the way it works, because it's not really two arguments anymore. It's two issues, 
but you've almost, think of it as like adding an advantage to your affirmative. Sometimes they call those add-on advantages. Sometimes like if you're, there's a rounder you're just crushing someone and you have extra time to read an extra affirmative advantage, sometimes people do that to rub it in the negative or something. I don't know why people do it, but they're add-on advantages. You should almost think of the, if you make say, like run a disad, that disad is no longer one issue in your one and R. <coughs> that disad is a disad and it's an impact calculus. So they have to cover both the disad and the impact calculus. They can't cover just one of those two things. And so even though it seems like they only have a disad answer, that's not really what's happening. Because you spent four minutes going for a disad in your one and R, you've turned that argument into lots of things. And you spent time telling the judge, like, this is the key argument. This is the thing they have to answer. If they don't respond to this, they're behind in the debate. Like, or you're saying things like, because they conceded the link level, that means if there's any risk of line impacts, like they, all they've done in this disad is play defense on the uniqueness and play defense on the impacts, and so they've conceded the link. That's devastating for them. Like, whatever, whatever you, whatever you choose to go for, you're turning that argument into something much bigger than it was previously. It's not really just a disad anymore. Now it's a disad and a ballot. They have to answer your ballot arguments and the disad arguments. So really, it might feel like you collapsed down to two things, but that's not what's happening. You've collapsed down to two things, but made each of them much larger than they ever were before. Highlighted all the important things that are key to the debate and key to the negative winning the debate. Um, and so it actually is much more difficult. I think that if someone goes for everything in their uh, one and R, usually that makes a two AR much easier. Because if they haven't spent a lot of time making ballot arguments in their one and R, then you don't really have to spend that much time making ballot arguments in your two AR. All you have to do is cover. If you cover and there's no unexposed blue ink in the two AR, you'll probably win the debate. They didn't spend any time persuading the judge to vote for them. Maybe you don't have to either. All you have to do is cover. You're probably ahead in the debate. And if you can cover and spend time making arguments for the ballot, you're definitely going to win the debate if you do affirmative. Right? So if you're the one in R, you have to make arguments for the ballot. And remember, you are almost time skewed yourself because your two speeches have gotten shorter. So you've had to make a minute back. You have seven minutes to read all your arguments your one and see. You only have six minutes to make all your arguments in. And a lot of that time gets back because you're not going to read a lot of cards in the one and R. I understand that. Um, but you can really get that time back and really take advantage by collapsing. Because you can explode the arguments you're going for, make arguments about why they access the ballot and they access the win. Um, and that makes it much harder for the two AR to keep up when they have to answer your disad and your ballot, your T and your ballot, or your case arguments and your ballot. Like now they have to answer two facets of every argument. And if they don't, if they fail to, they're way behind in the debate and they'll probably lose. Um, so collapsing the debate is what really stretches the two AR. And that is like the most important thing probably about talking to time skew is that you just, it just seems, because I understand that on first glance it sounds like spreading them out, having as many arguments as you can on as many ways. Because remember, we talked about in the beginning, how do you pressure the affirmative into mistakes? Have as much argument diversity as you can. That's true in the one NC, but it's not true as much in the one in R anymore. Like, you had the diversity originally in the one NC so that you could collapse down to arguments, the one argument or two arguments you wanted to win in the one in R. You, they've already made their mistakes in the one AR. That's what they make. You're not trying to force the two AR to make mistakes. You're trying to put force the one AR to make is one way to think about it. Because once you've collapsed, you've already that pushes pressure, puts enough pressure on the two AR. You don't have to like try to spread the two AR out too. You just have to put pressure on that, make it harder for them to access the ballot. The only way you can do that is by accessing the ballot yourself. If you don't do that and forget to do that, now you've almost time skewed yourself by going for too much. Um, <clears throat> you should refer to as the neg under coverage. If you think that there's been a colossal waste of time somewhere, say that. Put it in the judge's minds that the, your opponent has made mistakes. Like, make the judge <coughs> unsympathetic to their 2AR appeals to try to get out of things. Like, they're going to make appeals and make new arguments in the 2AR to try to get out of the things you're going for. The judge will be less sympathetic to those appeals and to those arguments if you've already pointed out how screwed they are. Obviously, you don't want to use that kind of language, but you want to say things like, the firm made a big mistake by not answering X, Y, and Z on the disad debate. That's going to be that I'm going to make them pay for that uh, when we get to this point, or whatever kind of language you want to use 